Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. It is that time of week again. It's Friday night. I'm Kev Baker, the co-host to Anthony Patch, and this is the Anthony Patch Show. Another week has gone by already. I can't believe it. It's the blink of an eye. And what an amazing show Mr. Patch has lined up for us all tonight, because in our number two, we are going to be joined by author, lecturer, filmmaker, and the man himself, the intrepid explorer, L.A. Marzulli, is coming on to the Anthony Patch Show. He's going to be joining us in our number two. I can't wait to get into all of that. We've had talk of Bilderberg and CERN this week. We've got all other news to cover as well. And to do that, we have got the man himself, author, researcher, and the man behind Entangled e-magazine, Mr. Anthony Patch. Here we are again, Tony. Another week already, man. I'm sure glad we're on radio because you always make me blush. <laughs> I'm good at that, right? I've got that whole kind of intro thing down to fine art now. You sure do. What are you up to? Almost 900 shows now? Nearly 800. Getting there. Getting there, man. Yeah, you, well, good practice. Thanks <laughs> for bringing, bringing us in. Welcome to everybody in chat as well. All our usual crazies are in the chat room. We love you all. We got Robbie and Sarah and Robbie and Sarah and Robbie and Sarah. They keep posting over and over. I guess they're dominating chat today. No, but any, everybody's in there. Our usuals, Dark Waters in there, I see you. It's just amazing. We have a core group of really great contributors and researchers. Not only in chat do they talk with us, Kev, but they talk to us through emails. And it is fantastic because we keep getting fresh information. We can't see it and read it all. Um, one of the things that popped in today was about CERN, and you asked me to address it because there's some... You know, I like to call it YouTube land because it's just like, wow, it's you talk about woo on Freaky Friday. YouTube <laughs> is just bizarre. Anyway, they're all they're all a gaga, if I can say that, about CERN today and their involvement at Bilderberg. So what did you want me to address? What what's your burning issue regarding well, this story? Friends, Aaron and Melissa, Truth Stream Media, they put out a really good video highlighting the fact that from what they could see, this was going to be the first year that the head honcho from CERN was actually attending one of these Bilderberg meetings. Now, I tried to have a little look around the net today, but it's hard to trace the attendees of these meetings back any further than 10 years. So I was just wanting to get your take on what you think is going on, Tony, the fact that we've got somebody from CERN now appearing at this Bilderberg meeting that has everyone losing their mind every year as all these <laughs> shady characters get together. Yeah, you know, as we have said privately, and we'll share the audience, that if it's a public meeting now and they have a press release and a press agent, then it's really not very secretive anymore. Whatever's really going on is not happening at Bilderberg. But in a nutshell, I'll tell you, I'll give you the punchline up front and then we'll, we'll backfill, which is what I like to do. Um, this is a status report. This is a report to the stakeholders. Uh, there are 22 members of CERN. These are member nations of CERN. And the director general, who was just appointed in uh, January of 2016, her name is Fabiola Giannotti. And she obviously is from Italy, but she is a physicist. She was directly involved in running the ATLAS experiment, the collaboration, the de one of the four detectors, the ALICE. And she is, as the director general, one of her primary functions is budget, budget planning, budget oversight. I believe that what she is simply doing is making a budgetary report to the stakeholder nations that are in attendance there. I took the list of attendees at Bilderberg this year, cross-referenced with the 22 member nation states of CERN itself. And they're all fully represented there. So she is making what is known as a stakeholders report through her mechanism as a director of the stakeholder relations department at CERN. And there's a mandate 
Um, we can go through the mandate of the stakeholders um, department or division. But really, in a nutshell, uh, it is unusual that she is there. Uh, I've not seen CERN attend Bilderberg events, as you say, going back to 2010. Um, does it portend the opening of a portal this year? Does it mean that she's announcing to them, hey, guys, we got it all set, we're ready to go, and we're on budget, and we're going to open it up in September? You know what? I'm not the guy that's going to say that because I don't have the facts. I don't have the proof. I don't have anything in front of me that I can come up with that tells me they're going to open it in September, nor that that's what she's talking about to them. I think it is simply a budgetary report that she is making and just giving them an update because, you know, they they have increased their efficiency, their power, so to speak, in what is now run two of um, the two runs that are interrupted by machine development. They always shut down for about three months every year and they do upgrades and repairs. What they're about to do is to shut down for two to three years at the end of this year and they will be swapping out the superconducting magnets changing over from niobium and uh, titanium to niobium and tin that's the major upgrade that will take a couple of years to do i think that's probably part of her report is to say yeah we're going to wind down run number two this is what we're doing with the awake project and then we're going to rebuild the machine, and this is what it's going to cost, and we're on plan and we're on budget. But there is so much going on surrounding September. It does cause one to stop and think, wow, could they really do it this year? And you know what? What do you think? Yeah, Tony, when I look at this, I mean, like I say, I'm a veteran of Bilderberg, right? Been there. I mean, what that means, it means nothing, but. I was shocked at the fact in 2013 they had a press officer and the fact that we were able to get some, okay, very kind of edited and censored information out of there. But thanks to the tireless work of Jim Tucker over years, years and years covering that, not many people listening, now we're living in a time where most people do know what the Bilderberg Group are. And like I was explaining to you in 2013, all of these powerful people attending, they arrived from various locations around the country having just attended meetings that nobody knew about. Now, I'm thinking that most of the shady deals and the real power plays are made away from the actual Bilderberg get-together, and that's more of a jolly at the end of a week-long kind of session of talking workshops and stuff like that. But, you know, it is interesting to see CERN there, and it could well be just looking for more funding, stuff like that. But again... yeah. I honestly do think now, Tony, although I I love to talk about Bilderberg, I really do, because I think it serves as a good tool to wake people up to the fact there are shady groups that run the planet. I don't think it's as powerful as maybe we all suspect it once was. Yeah, and if you look at the list of attendees, and it's, it's out there, it's easy to find, just search it, and you have already, I'm just telling the audience, you look at the um, the companies, the investment groups, the, the think tanks, even NATO is there, um, and the UN. Really, this is more, I would say, more like a conference than it is anything that's really super secret. And, you know, they're setting the agenda for humanity for the next year. I really think that this comes down to discussions about financial planning. And I'm going to give you an excerpt from an article that of an interview with Fabiola Giannotti uh, conducted by Euro News. One of the statements that she said in there, um, the question was, what do you think of scientific research in Europe? Are there enough opportunities for young researchers? This was asked by Euro News. She replied, generally speaking, there are problems securing funds for fundamental research, which are more or less serious depending on the country. Applied research tends to get more funding when easily, more easily as it yields short-term results. Of course, it is important to fund applied research, but we must not forget the fundamental research is equally important. 
even though res results cannot be seen immediately, but in the long term. That is a typical financial statement. You're talking to people who have a short-term return on investment mentality in the business community. And she's there pleading the case that even if we can't in the short term show you something wonderful and fabulous coming out of CERN, you have to invest for the long term. So that backs up my statement that she's making a financial report saying this is what we've achieved and this is what we plan for. So keep sending us money because we're doing wonderful things. Maybe she's there to make a presentation about the Mandela effect. <laughs> oh, gosh. <laughs> course except that that her, her name will be changed before she presents to the group and you know we'll be covering the builder woo as i'm calling it on freaky friday straight after the anthony patch show but something far more important in my opinion than any meeting of billionaires and senators and all those freaky cats is the release of this new e-magazine mr patch entangled this is what it's all about tell tell the audience what's happening with this man because oh. There's so many so it, plans afoot. That it's exciting stuff. Is this infomercial time? It is, shamelessly. I'm the king oh, of shameless God. plugs. <laughs> all right. Okay, well, if we must. Let, let, let me just lay it out, first of all, with a thank you. <clears throat> thank you to you, Kev, Lynn Liaz, Chris from End Times Matrix News, our own contributor, um, Robbie, uh, we have Rebecca who contributed as well to our first issue, and we were under kind of a time crunch. So the first issue isn't, you know, all the bells and whistles that we want. But I, I want to just say what the purpose is. The purpose really is to give the audience an opportunity to get into the deeper um, technical issues or aspects of the things that you and I talk about on these shows, your show and my show. Um, it's also to share scripture because this is a Christian program and the magazine Entangled is a Christian-based magazine. That is our perspective. We provide the scientific, we provide the scriptures. We provide our commentary and our insights. We also have videos. Lynn Liaz had one of her great um, YouTube videos linked to her article, so it was an interactive process. And this is really what we're trying to achieve, is to balance out, if you want to call it the spiritual with the physical, because you cannot separate the two, as I often say. Entangled is to provide more in-depth information than what we can cover on our shows. It's also to provide a platform for people who do not have a radio show to be able to get their information out that they research, that they would like to convey to other people. So it is a platform for other people other than just myself to, you know, be spouting off all the time. So I encourage the listeners to email me at anthonypatchauthor at gmail.com or go to my contact tab on my homepage at anthonypatch.com. If you want to submit articles, they can be, you know, within a reasonable length, let's say three or four pages, let's say somewhere in the neighborhood of a thousand to fifteen hundred words. I'm not trying to be restrictive, but we would like to give you a voice, and it adds variety. It doesn't have to be about science. It doesn't have to be about Christianity. I will, of course, reserve the right to be the editor. But my point is, I want to encourage people that feel that they have something they want to share with other people to do that through Entangled, an e-magazine. Um, you can buy individual issues or you can buy for twenty four ninety five a yearly subscription. E either way you want to do it. Um, we are moving towards trying to make this a as fully interactive as we can. We started with the videos. We want to go to you know more music from Robbie. We want to go to having links to more in-depth resources beyond the depth of the article itself. So really, that's an, in a nutshell. It is a platform for our audience to interact with a bigger audience than they individually are able to do, and for them to interact with you and me, Kev, and the other contributors that form sort of our core group at this point. 
You so what are your thoughts on that? This is why you were always perfect for TFR. You really were, because, I mean, Chris and Shuri and building this network, it was exactly the same idea. It was never about them. It was about giving other people a platform, a voice. I copied that into the Kev Baker show. Might have my name on the door, as your does here, Tony. But it's not about us. It's about giving a platform to real people out there who maybe not, they wouldn't get heard otherwise. And that, for me, fills me with a lot more pride than me sitting speaking myself for 60 minutes. And to hear you talking that way about the Entangled magazine, it's just music to my ears. And it just proves that we are all one big family here at TFR. And be it Entangled, be it the network, be it our individual shows, it's all about you out there. And I can't wait to see what the listeners bring because I tell you, Tony, most of my shows, most of the material I get, it comes from all of them out there. It really does. Yeah, and that's our point, is that this is supposed to be interactive. We're supposed to be the focal point where things and people, ideas can come together, and then we function as the conduit for the things that we gather. We then get it back out there. So that's what a broadcaster is supposed to do. We're supposed to broadcast. So through Entangled, people don't have the time or you know, the inclination to get on the internet like you and I are doing and do a show. Some people just aren't comfortable with that, but they're fabulous researchers and fabulous writers. They're enthusiastic about their topics. So let's give them a platform and that can add to the vocal platform of truth frequency radio. It just really gives you more information and it saves time for people because we're able to coalesce research that would otherwise take a long time for people to research on their own. And it's almost like you have to know enough to ask the right questions. You have to know enough to even ask the question of where do I go to find something on the Internet? Because the Internet is so huge. So we're providing you an expeditious way to be exposed to things and in more depth than you're going to see in La La YouTube land. <laughs> La La YouTube land. You know that's where I reside, Tony. I love it in there and amongst the crazies. But, you know, I'm looking at some of the stuff coming up. Even in the chat room, some of this art that the listeners make, even that, we could throw that into e-magazine as well because, you know, just make a center spread of all these pictures. The time that people put into these, Tony, I think it'd be perfect for Entangled. That is what I mean. If you have artwork if you have music like Robbie does and Cheryl, his wife, it's multimedia. Why not? I mean, whatever we can pack into this, we're going to pack into it. And in between those issues, I, I want to encourage people to subscribe because before each Friday show, I will be sending a specific article to the main topic of that show so that the day of, before the show broadcast, you'll receive as a subscriber, like the subscribers did today, an article from me above and beyond what is published in the Entangled. And that's going to continue. It's not like the first of the month, the magazine comes out and you read it and that's it. What we're going to do in between the publication dates at the first of the month is to pack in a whole lot of other stuff. So you're going to be fired, not ads, not solicitations, but information, artwork, fun things, music. So it's not just the single issue. We're just going to continue to bombard you until you tell us, no, don't keep sending me all this stuff. Because we want to give you a lot of value for your money. We want to give you good information, but we also want to give you entertainment. We want to provide for you because I'm a pretty serious guy, but I like humor. And I like creativity, and that balances out what could otherwise really become very depressing and discouraging information. So it's that balance that we're achieving through Entangled. And I, I love to hear your humorous side, I really do. And like you say, it's hard when we cover these topics, you know. But you know, something else that came to us during the week, Tony, and it would be perfect for Entangled, we could make it an exclusive and this came from a listener in Europe, didn't it? Because they took the time to tweet my lover, <laughs> my secret lover, Elon <laughs> Musk. There's pictures in the chat room, me and Love Hearts, it's true. 
All the rumours are true. I am his fanboy. I'm taking the mask off, or do I take the musk off? I don't know. <laughs> but somebody <laughs> actually tweeted at Elon Musk for him to come on the show, didn't he? They did. I, I really want to thank, you know, when people take the initiative to do something like that, I am just stunned. Because most people won't do things like that for other people. I shouldn't say that. It's judgmental. But I'm just surprised. I, I, I welcome it. I love it when people take the initiative and say, hey, why don't you do this, you know, for Anthony and for Kev? Or like Robbie does. He sends me all these ideas like a board game. Sends me ideas for songs. He sends artwork in, merchandising ideas. Okay, why not? Why not? Why not send that stuff to me? Is it going to hurt to shoot ideas by me? No. And I mentioned the board game because Robbie put it up on the in the chat room. He put up Strangelets, the family board game, and it's from the the uh, toy company that he put, came up with the name with, has been instead of Hasbro. I mean, this is the kind of stuff that just bowls me over. I love it. I love the creativity. So we may be coming out with a board game. It isn't because we're trying to merchandise and we're trying to squeeze money out of people. It's for fun. It's to offset all of the nonsense that's going on in this world right now. That's why we're doing it. We want to laugh about what's going on, the absurdity of it all. Well, you know, Tony, let's keep this feel-good factor going. We're a few minutes out from the break, and I, I can't wait. I honestly can't hide my anticipation here because you've gone and got L.A. Marzulli coming up in the second half of this show. Now, I mean, how did this even come about, Tony? L.A. is a good friend of mine. Um, he's an extensive researcher, which I totally respect. But you know what? He is so down-to-earth, he and his wife, just very genuine people. They're givers. They're not takers. They're easy to talk to. Uh, I first had a face-to-face. -face. I mean, LA and I had corresponded for a long time, but we had met face-to-face -face at a conference about a year and a half ago. And, and he said, hey, can I interview you? You know, and I said, yeah, who am I to turn away from a camera? <laughs> so uh, Anyway, we, we hit it off. We compared notes. He's always asked intelligence question, intelligent questions. He and I were at a wedding for John B. Wells uh, last Sunday. And, um, of course, he put me on camera, which is ridiculous. But anyway, we were talking, and I said, hey, why don't you come on the show? I know you're taking off for Peru pretty soon, and he may you know, be more specific about that today in the show. But uh, I said, before you go to Peru, can you squeeze in a conversation with Kev Baker and myself? Because I've never had a guest on the show. I would like you to be the first. And he said, of course. So we put it together, and here we are. It's going to be absolutely fantastic. I've spoke to him one time on Freaky Friday. It was all about giants and stuff like that. And I just can't wait to hear all the latest stuff he's been getting into and, of course, it ties in with this article that you sent out to the subscribers tonight about UFO propulsion. It's going to be off the charts, and I can't think of a, a better lead-in to Freaky Friday either, Tony. Absolutely brilliant, man. Yeah, I uh, sent to the subscribers of Entangled an article entitled UFO Propulsion Systems. And some people that I uh, have shared that with, uh, in the past that have emailed me. If people want to, you know, email me and ask for a copy of it, even if you're not a subscriber, I'd be happy to share it with you. It's, it's short. It came about because I also write for L.A. Marzulli's own e-magazine called the PPNS Report. And I've been doing that for about six months now. And this is one of the articles that I published in his magazine because we'd had a conversation about... Uh, UFO systems, how would they be propelled? And he asked me, he said, what do you think from a physics standpoint? And I said, well, I've never really taken a stab at it, but I'll, I'll give it some thought and I'll write you an article. And that's what happened. So if people want to read that, I'd be happy to send it to them. No, well, I think this is going to be absolutely amazing. It's going to be a highlight right here on TFR for sure. And of course, don't forget, folks, right after Anthony's show, I'll be jumping on with the craziest Woo crew in town. We'll be doing Freaky Friday, and it's Builder Woo. We'll be going live 
to Chantilly, Virginia, to speak to Chris Dan C. Harris, one of our very own hosts here on the network. He is live at ground zero of this year's Builder Woo meeting. We'll be finding out all the characters that he's been shouting at as they've drove into the hotel, all the people he's been meeting, and get to find, well, hopefully find out what it is they're talking about inside that meeting this year. All that to look forward to. And if that isn't enough, right after Freaky Friday, Chris and Cherie Geo, they invite you beyond the veil. No need to go anywhere tonight. TFR has got it all going on. We'll be back in three short moments. So don't go anywhere. You're listening to the True Frequency Radio Network. No hate, no hype, no, no, no fear. All righty. Well, thank you, Robbie Spencer and Cheryl, his wife, for Strange Slits. That song has really resonated with a lot of people. And I really thank you, Robbie, for your creativity. And there's a lot more coming. Uh, we hope that there's going to actually be an album available. Again, just to keep things fun, keep things happy, and move right along. I want to ask Kev a question. And that is, with all of these shows like Ancient Aliens out there, why is this proliferation of movies and television shows pushing this whole thing about aliens and UFOs? What, what's the agenda behind doing all this? Because they're not going to spend all this money to put these shows on just for giggles. Oh, Tony, now you're coming to my side of the swimming pool. This is the kind of <laughs> realms that I absolutely dwell in. You know, I've watched this whole al- ancient alien phenomenon, and even as a young child, always looking up to the sky, growing up in the highlands, vast open spaces, you could see stars everywhere. You would see shooting stars, things that you'd question in the sky, and I, I always used to question whether we were alone. And that's where I came from as a young guy. But, you know, even growing up, you, we've all seen it. Little Green Men, any UFO story, anything like that. It's just ridiculed. And it's kind of along the same lines as when the CIA came up with the term conspiracy theorist. You know, you play the X-Files music or you start, ooh, Twilight Zone. And it just totally knocks people. It totally degrades the whole topic. Nobody wants to touch it. And then we see this kind of massive change. And it was a massive change. It was like a paradigm shift because it used to be that these programs were very much the stuff of ridicule. And that's not me saying that, but that's the way they were treated on the TV. You would see it all the time. The voiceover would make fun of the witnesses that they were using for just their own purposes to totally knock anyone's interest off the whole subject. But then it changes. We have Giorgio who I love, can't pronounce his second name, crazy hairdo, absolutely great, love the whole Ancient Alien series. He speaks to a whole heap of really interesting researchers, Eric Von Doniken, the first guy who came up with Chariots of the Gods, I believe it was, and that was putting forward this Ancient Alien hypothesis. Now, I think it's been a deliberate shift because... You don't just get that kind of change overnight, especially on mainstream channels. And they are mainstream. The History Channel, they've got an agenda. They're always pushing something. There's always Nazis on there somewhere as well. Have you ever noticed that? But when it (laughs) came to this ancient aliens, Tony, it just appeared overnight. And it's so, so popular. And like I say, I step back and maybe I overanalyze things. But you've got to look at trends. And why are they doing this? Why is this popular now? And it's... To me, anyway, they're trying to change people's ideas about the whole subject. They're trying to make people question our very origins. And in fact, they're making it quite cool. They've got the young Giorgio on there. He's a cool guy. He's like Indiana Jones. He's out and about. He's up at the Nascar lines one week, down at the pyramids the next. Great stuff. But for me, there is some kind of agenda afoot here. And I think it plays into the whole long game of this thing that they call disclosure. Because I don't think there's ever going to be a moment where we get true, proper disclosure. Here's all the facts. Here's the technology. I think it will be used as some kind of agenda. And like I was sharing with you during the break, I know it's very hypothetical, this thing they call Project Bluebeam, where we would have some kind of alien invasion or religious deities appearing in the sky. And all of it, of course being used as a tool, a problem reaction solution to bring about a one world order, a new world government, 
you create a global crisis, Tony, and it requires a global solution. You could wipe out all the individual religions as they are just now, of one religion that encapsulates all. All that kind of things are possible. And when you see people being kind of programmed, because that's why they're called programs on the television, to be more open to this kind of scenario, well, I think there's a game afoot. We love our games, Tony, and there's always something psychological going on to everything that we see and hear. Very well put, my friend. Uh, let's flip it 180 degrees, because I always like to do that when we do research, is to <clears throat> flip things around and look at it differently. What if it was true? What well, if it was true, panspermia, that we are descendants from the stars, that are, are the, uh, the Anunnaki, whoever it is? What if we really are descendants from somewhere out in the cosmos? You see, I've put this forward before, right? And myself and Joe, we've kind of locked horns over this. Because I, I think this kind of scenario doesn't take away from the whole Christian storyline or there being a, a God, per se, because somebody still has to put all of that in motion. And, you know, if you think about that whole comet thing, it's a common analogy, a metaphor, whatever you call it, but that comet with the tail on it coming and hitting the Earth, it's like an egg, isn't it? It's almost like an egg being fertilized by a sperm. So, I mean, I, I can totally see that. Yeah, I mean, I try not to be dogmatic in, in any area of research. I try to be open-minded. Even though I take things from a Christian perspective, I do try to weigh things out. It doesn't mean that I discount my belief and my faith. But, you know, this is all created by God. And therefore, you have to look at all of the possibilities as to creation, as to the structure of the universe, whether it's the Big Bang scenario or, you know, my tetrahedron replication scenario. Who knows? But you really, when you stop and you think about and you look at the scale of the universe, you start with just our little planet here. And then you go out into the solar system and out into the Milky Way and you continue on out into the universe. And it is just staggering as somebody posted in chat earlier, you know, my my statement about light, that the distances in the universe are so vast that when we observe the cosmos through the Hubble Space Telescope or however, that light actually appears to be at a standstill even though it's traveling at 186,000 miles per second. That's a round figure. So something that is moving at the speed of light, which is light, appears to be stationary due to the scale of the universe. Just that alone makes you stop and think, well, what are the possibilities that there's life out there? Because we literally are smaller than a grain of sand in the scheme of things. And, you know, Tony, I mean... This is where I'm quite controversial and a bit weird, probably, because like, you know, I just had the health thing that happened. I even had Laura Maxwell come up. We prayed together quickly before she left, uh, visiting one night and I accepted Jesus into my life and things, right? You know, I've started to open myself up to more of this. But I still don't like going back to the Bible. And it's because it's almost like a set of rules and it's been written by man. And I know that sounds really kind of combative and controversial it's not the way it's intended and even to call myself a christian i don't like doing that because it's like putting a label on myself i mean i, I like to think that now i've got some kind of entanglement with the lord jesus but i don't like the fact that i have to follow that set of books or i have to kind of call myself one thing because it's almost like putting yourself in some pigeonhole, Tony. And I know that sounds controversial, but does that make sense? And that's why <laughs> it it's, does. Really, it's really easy for me then to say that I'm very open to there being life out there and not in any way taken away from a God or a Jesus either. Maybe these planets have their own Jesus story. Sure. And I think it's just important to remember that the label of Christian is man's label. It's a personal relationship with our Savior. 
There is only one thing that I would truly emphasize, and that is that there is only one way to God. There is only one way to salvation, and that's through Jesus Christ himself. It's through the Holy Spirit. It's not through the Pope. It's not through the Hindu religion. It's not through the Muslim religion. And, you know, if all those people want to get excited and upset, oh, well, too bad. But in my frame of understanding, you can take the Christian label off if you have to, because it does have that man's label and representation to what otherwise is just a personal relationship. And that's all it is. I talk about, you know, having a walking conversation, continual conversation with Jesus Christ. That doesn't mean that I hear his voice in my skull, okay? It's just that's the, that's the progress that you make in maturing as a Christian into going from, well, I have to get down on my knees and pray, to taking those baby steps towards a very intimate, close relationship with a close friend. And, and you that's know, really how I view it. Uh, it's great you used the actual phrase there, that voice in your skull, because we need to be very careful at this time, right? Because that Project Bluebeam, a part of that is the projection of voices into our heads. And it'll say it's Jesus, it'll say it's Allah, Muhammad, whatever religious deity pertains to you. And they really do have the potential to do that right now at any moment. And that in itself, Tony, you wouldn't need any aliens turning up in the sky, real, fake or otherwise, if we start hearing religious voices in our minds. Yeah, I mean, it even says in Scripture that God will send, God will send a great deception. Okay, I'm paraphrasing. I'm just saying that he will actually, as a form of judgment, because of those that turn away from God, turn away from Jesus Christ, that they will be deceived. And the deception comes from God himself because it's part of his plan. It's a form of punishment. He gives everybody that opportunity and that chance to hear about him and to come to him. But those that purposefully turn away from God, turn away from Jesus Christ, turn away from that salvation, that gift, there are consequences to that. And therefore, it does say in Scripture that a grand deception will come from God himself, that even the elect could be deceived. And that brings us full circle back to this whole discussion of aliens and UFOs, and we're kind of setting the stage for our guest, L.A. Marzuli, who's going to join us in about 20 minutes' time. Because... We do have to look at this from a spiritual aspect. This is a spiritual war that we're encountering now. It says in Scripture that you wrestle not against flesh and blood, you wrestle against spirits, spiritual entities. We wrestle against demonic forces. My short statement about aliens, aliens are demonic. The communication with the other side is communicating with the dead. The television shows presenting ancient aliens and the ancestors from the stars. Understanding what I prefaced it by, that you have to keep an open mind. But I think the majority of what is being put out in terms of abductions, and I think L.A. will probably touch on this, when we get into talking about abduction scenarios, that clearly is coming from a demonic aspect. And many instances on the record in which people have undergone hypnosis, regression, things like that, they have said that if they spoke the name of Jesus Christ during an abduction, that immediately they're returned to their home, to their place where they were abducted from. It is literally the commanding of the name of Jesus Christ in the scenario that's playing out of the abduction that saves them. And this is typically said by people who are not born-again Christians, who are, don't have the Holy Spirit. Where I'm ending with this statement is, I can't say definitively, case by case, because I'm not a researcher like L.A. on this subject, 
But my understanding from this is that people who do not have the Holy Spirit don't have the full armor of God to protect them, and therefore are subject to not only deception, but these abductions. Because it appears that most of the people, if not all of them, that have been abducted were not Christians. They did not have the Holy Spirit protecting them. What do you think about that? Well, Tony, I've spoke to a lot of people who claim to have experienced these very things. And it's the common trait throughout every single story. I speak to Bill Bean, Laura Maxwell, all these types of people as well who have been in these situations. And it's the one word. That one word, it cancels it all. It sends them back to where they came from. And I always think of spells as, or sorry, as words as being spells because you individually spell a word and it's got magical powers. Mm-hmm. And that one word alone, and like you say, the spiritual armor that that comes with, it's enough to get rid of these things. And, you know, these abductions as well, you know, I think a lot of them, I can't say a lot of them, that would be, a, I just think there's a proportion of them that may even have more our worldly explanations to them. Uh, there's something called my labs, and that's military abductions. Sounds a bit out there, right? But we do know that they can plant false memories into people's minds now. And who's to say that it isn't just some kind of really dark project, military kind of stuff going on, and you're left with the impression that it was some kind of alien abduction. It's not to say they're all that, though. I'm telling you, because I do believe there are some out there that do come down here for nefarious reasons, let me tell you. But I've been thinking about this a lot, Tony, as well, and we talk about AI. And I think if we are visited by something from another planet, another world, if it's travelled interstellar, I think the chances are going to be that, in all likelihood, it might be an AI that we deal with. Now, I say that because... Just the time for deep space travel and the restrictions that would have on any biological entity, the radiations involved, and I get they're aliens, maybe they can cope with that. But just even the times involved, I think it's more likely, like Musk wants to do, autonomous rockets, autonomous capsules, send out robots first ahead of things. I think we'll be dealing with an AI, and then we could have a problem, right, because There is a chance then you were talking about God sending a deception. I mean, wouldn't the ultimate deception be, right, aside from an alien AI, the AI that we talk about at CERN just posing as that Christ consciousness, connecting us all together. And I think that's where we're leading to, Tony. Yeah, I agree with you. In fact, I had much the same conversation with my friend and co-collaborator and researcher, Chris, from End Times Matrix News we were talking about consciousness we were speaking in relation to um jupiter and venus the birthing of jupiter um, revelation 12 september 23rd um in the constellation there that we were talking about the consciousness that is derived not only from d-wave and their ai systems but also the consciousness of the planets her research is ancient egyptology and Their belief system, in a nutshell, was that the planets are living entities, that they have their own individual consciousness, and that as a solar system, as a group of planets, they are quantum entangled. They are consciously entangled. And as I've said with you many times, talking about the Birkeland currents coming from CERN to Saturn and interconnecting and enhancing the pre-existing electrical connection between the planets. It is to raise the consciousness contained within the planets. Now that sounds very new age, but again, keeping an open mind, looking at their belief system, looking at the physics as well that is driven by that belief system that has its origins from ancient Egypt, we begin to see the picture of what they're trying to achieve and their artificial intelligence and their artificial consciousness, they believe is derived from the planets themselves. And this is where you get into the whole storyline of the different entities, their aspects, their male, female, all of these godheads. All of this goes back to Egypt. So what I'm saying here is that 
their consciousness that they're trying to raise, not only with humans, select humans, is a demonic origin of consciousness. We are talking about the consciousness of Lucifer. This is not the consciousness that God wants us to ascend to, as in the New Age parlance. This consciousness that they want everyone to be plugged into through D-Wave and the sentient world simulation is the consciousness of Lucifer. That's the best way I can sum it up. Yeah, that's pretty much, yeah. It's kind of along the same lines I'm going with, Tony, you know, and it's just funny how even the kind of topics we're going to be touching tonight all can tie into the stuff that we've been talking about for years now. Everything's coming together. Steal your word. It's a coalescence, Tony. Yeah. <laughs> the, the, the much anticipated book, Coalescence, yes. How, how is it coming on, man? I mean, is it true that there's like a huge, vast chunk of the Amazon rainforest in danger by now? Yeah, it's so big and so <laughs> You know, it's funny. This goes back to the magazine Entangled because Entangled is our step towards that book. Much of what people will see in the e-magazine are the first, let's call them the headers, the headers of the chapters of what is in Coalescence. Coalescence, of course, being a book, will be much deeper than even the magazine will be able to attend to or to be able to treat. So what you're getting through the magazine is a taste of coalescence. You're seeing the table of contents as it evolves and, and where we're going with it. So we're making progress. We're getting there. And we really felt that because the issues that you and I talk about, that Chris and I research about, are time sensitive. They can't wait for a book. They need to get out to the public right away so that they can start their own research. These are like teasers, these articles. They're to prompt you to go in, a, in, your, in your own areas of interest. And it's like I said before, you almost need to know enough to ask the right questions. We're giving you those promptings to ask those research questions, to know what rabbit holes to, to go look at. Because a lot of times people don't even know where to find a rabbit hole. And, and that's what we're achieving through the magazine um, entangled. So we only have about four minutes. I just wanted to go back to what you very briefly mentioned, and that was spells. Because again, Chris and I were talking about this last night. I took it down to the physics. I took it down to the finite definition. A spell changes the spin of quantum particles. It actually changes the spin, the quantum spin of quantum particles, the quarks and all the other things that we talk about, including strangelets. If you think about quantum particles, the primordial particles that make up everything, like a compass with a compass needle, and the arrow of the compass points towards north or a strong magnetic source, what is happening when you speak the words of a spell, even saying the words of Jesus Christ, like in the abduction scenario, what happens in the world of quantum mechanics is that the energy wave of your spoken word, the wavelength, the waveform, the frequency, that literal sound wave of energy is taken in by your quantum computer, the human brain. And at the quantum level, down in those microtubules we always talk about, and when we talk about quantum dimers, the zero and one binary pair, down at that minute level, you're actually changing the spin of your quantum dimers. You're reorienting the compass needle to point in a different direction. That's what manifests as a spell that changes the way that people think and behave. That is what happens when you command evil, be it a demon, be it Lucifer himself, when you command in the name of Jesus Christ that they flee, you, are, you have that power. That is the power through the Holy Spirit, to command them to flee. By doing that, you are aligning their quantum particles. You're changing the spin of their quantum particles to flee. You are changing the way that those demons are thinking and behaving. 
when we talk about voice to skull technology and hearing voices in our heads because someone is using, let's just call it a microwave to send those signals, they're changing the spin of quantum particles, the tubulin dimers, the binary particles of our quantum computer. They're actually reprogramming your mind to think differently. That's what a spell does from the physics standpoint. And you know, there's another way we can demonstrate this as well. A very famous experiment by Dr. Inamoto. And that was his water experiment where he put words, just written words onto test tubes of water and flash froze them. Now he would put the word love, happy, positive words on some. And then he would put hate, kind of kill, murder, all negative words on others. And he flash froze them. And when you examined the ice crystals under a microscope, the ones with positive words on it, they were like snowflakes. They were all symmetrical and just absolutely beautiful, all uniquely perfect in their own way. And yet, if you looked at the ones that had hate and kill and murder and all the ugh, horrible dark stuff, they were all irregular, just horrible, nothing to see here, just didn't look right. And that's exactly what Tony's talking about there, because those words are affecting the spin at a quantum level. Absolutely yeah. amazing. When you talk to your plants nicely, they grow better. See, it's all in the power of the words, Tony. But be very careful it. what words we're using. We'll be back after the break with L.A. Marzulli. Don't go anywhere. 